First off, I want you guys to all give yourselves a round of applause for getting up this morning. Thank you. Seriously. Um, I'm not going to dive too much into my story, but we'll hear a lot about it as we go through the presentation. But honestly, this is exactly what I do. I stand in the middle of a room where I barely know anybody, a room full of strangers, but I hope that a lots of friendships, lots of genuine new relationships and opportunities can come out of just having a dialogue. That's it. That's the simple, complex everything that I created with I Talk to Strangers, was just have a conversation. That's it. Working in the corporate world, working in federal government, working in nonprofit sectors, going to college, applying for jobs, trying to maintain jobs, trying to find relationships, trying to find friends. It all comes to the fundamental root of a conversation. That's how it all starts. So instead of me perfecting on how to earn a bunch of money or end up on TV or become rich and famous, I decided to perfect the art of conversation. So that's basically what the philosophy of the I Talk to Strangers Foundation really resonated from. What does it mean to sit and have a genuine conversation? And then guess what everybody told me? You're on to something huge. Huge. I never understood it. It didn't make any sense to me. I'm 28 years old, 2005, I graduated from, 2000, uh, from Titusville High School with no ambition other than I need to get out of Bavar County. <laughs> That's it. I don't know what else is out there, but I'm pretty sure once I leave 95 and get on I-10 and hit Florida State's campus, then there's going to be a new level of opportunities waiting for me. And that's exactly what it was. I had to become a new person, come into a new scenario with a bunch of strangers, and realizing that we all kind of go through this in life. So for a lot of the parents here, for a lot of the young adults, like definitely applaud you guys, because this is step one, if not just a recontinuation of what it means to be successful in life has nothing to do about the money, has nothing to do about where you've been or what you've seen. It's really about what you've done. And that's what I talk to strangers that brought me here today to teach and share and lecture about is the art of conversation. With my degree being in technology, I'm kind of at the centerfold of all of this. Where do I go? I study computers. They're fast. They're innovative. They're exciting. They make life easier. They make life exciting. We can connect places around the world just simply from our iPhones. Yet, there's no more conversation. It's odd. So while I'm studying in school, I actually have this paradox because in Titusville High School, I was a people person. I love to interact. I love to share. I would complain to my parents when we didn't have enough family game nights. I would complain to my parents when I didn't see my friends that often because it's important. Now I'm sitting in school, and I'm just, it's just me and a computer. That's all it is, just me and a computer screen. It drives me crazy. So that's really why I didn't decide to take the degree and do something within IT, because then there's no people. There's no people who work behind Facebook. There's just people who engage in an activity of technology. Interestingly enough, Google, the huge conglomerate, is actually one of my sponsors. They also have the challenge of compartmentalizing their engineers within their workplace and noticing that there's no conversation. Yes, we're a multi-billion dollar company, but if you ask per employee how they feel about their job, that's all they do is their job. So this is just not something that's happening here. It's all the way at the corporate level. It's internationally. Um, I've traveled with my girlfriend, Natalia, from Poland. And we worked together on UN initiatives with um, refugees. Um, we were living in Malaysia for 10 months. And we saw a completely different world, a true third world, where we didn't see anybody speak to each other, yet they all have cell phones. So coming back to Bavar County was very special for me because now I can actually take all this energy and take all these experiences and helpfully make a change. So hopefully we can start here today. So with technology and the digital revolution, it's scary. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it's completely scary. When I went to school building computers, it was just that. You're working on the next technology. And just at the end of the book, when it said the future outlook in the, that paragraph, like this is what the future is going to look like, that was 2010. We're here now. Five years from reading what the future looked like in my textbook, 
I'm actually looking at it in the world. So just to kind of give some of the parents like a, a real reality check, we're behind. I'm behind, and I study the subject. So hopefully through this conversation, we can teach you guys a lot of, um, not tricks per se, but just to kind of speed up the education gap as far as what your kids know and what you should know so that we can bring conversation and bring relationships back to the forefront within our homes. So, as I said, we're all strangers until we say hello. It's that simple. Take away all of what we know of the world today with the modernization of cell phones. I can actually still remember life without a cell phone. Many kids can't. I remember paying 10 cents per text message. I remember those things. I, my dad did not buy me a cell phone. Dad, can I have a cell phone? No. Why do you need one? For emergencies. <laughs> Come on, that's still working today? Seriously, that still works. So I can see how when I was 16 to a current 16-year-old right now, I see the difference. I see how they don't even know what is not available because they think that this is all that there is. If a child right now doesn't have a cell phone, they feel like they're not able to make friends. Okay, you just go to your friend's house, knock on the door. They feel like they can't build new relationships or be a part of groups, social groups. Join Little League or get an after school program. I was involved in like six programs after school simply because I had nothing else better to do with my time. So I see now kids don't have that anymore. A kid can lock himself in, the, in his room and he's no longer by himself, really. He's connected to the entire world. Reality check. When your child goes into their room and closes the door, they are now victim or participating in all kinds of things. It's a limitless internet. So don't ever think that the parental controls that you put on the phone features or even the school filters. It's very funny when I used to teach math at a school in Atlanta and the kids actually taught me how to break the filter. It's very, these kids are incredibly, incredibly smart. So just like the socialization in real life, kids need to understand that building relationships is not by keystroke. It's by words, it's by conversation, it's by interaction. Getting out there and making new friends, doing new things. So until we do that, we're all gonna be strangers. Not by Facebook friends, real friends. Peer-to-peer -peer social struggles. The ITTS movement encourages and challenges individuals to create genuine relationships through meeting new people. I'm a product of here, so this is not a foreign topic. This is a kid who grew up on Curtis Boulevard in Port St. John, who lost friends at a young age. Um, I'm sure that everybody has either heard of Curtis Fairchild and Kathy Jones, who were just released from prison. Those were my classmates. So my interaction with life growing up in Port St. John is completely different from what the kids are going through right now. They don't have a significant um, sensitivity to real life. When I talk to my friends right now about the kids that are running through the streets, they, it's like they're crazy because all they know is what they see on TV. It's okay to be exposed to it, but that's all they know. They think that um, Grand Theft Auto is a real thing. They think that these social groups, and just even hearing about some of the um, experiences from students being bullied, they're not, be I was bullied. I was beat up as a kid a few times. I was small, I had a high-pitched voice. The older guys just didn't like me. It's part of growing up. Kids are actually being bullied, but not by physical means, e emotional means, words. Words do hurt, and what I'm seeing is that words do kill. So this is something that we have to bring into the forefront within our relationships at home. We have to make sure that we're actually communicating to our kids as people, not as products, not as um, uh, just do something to get out of my way, because that's what's creating what I see on my end. So I'm at the, di I'm at the digital divide. I'm speaking to you guys, but I can go to another conversation with a bunch of kids and our parents don't get it. I'm like, but they do get it. No, they don't get it. We want their attention. We want their support. We want their friendship. We want their guidance. And this is one of the big things that ITTS is really focused on, the child level, teaching children that we care. When I sit and I talk to somebody who's 16 or 17 years old, 
and I'm crossing ethnic, racial, um, religious. For some reason, those are never boundaries for me. I never have, Robbie, you're, you're approaching me in a way that's making me feel disrespected or enclosed or not accepted. No. The true fact is that I just want to learn. Just like every parent, just like every family member, just like every friend. The more time that we spend in learning who we're talking to, the better we connect. And that's something that I learned throughout my travels with being an African American from Florida, from some reason being able to survive in Islamic Malaysia, for some reason being able to survive in Egypt, or across Europe, or Africa. And the one question people ask throughout your travels, do you ever have social barriers? Are people ever mean to you? And I'm like, no, I never give them a reason to be. I'm able to cross these social lines and these age barriers just like anybody else in this room can. It's just that I have to decrease my assumptions and increase my listening. And I think that's a really tangible skill that not just parents, but just people in general can really adopt. And if we're really trying to break through to our children, if we're really trying to listen to what our true issues in society are, let's truly ask the right questions. Your children are very, very intelligent, seriously intelligent. They're just misguided. They're being guided through the things that they see on the internet or things that they see on TV and not by things like this. All of these great organizations, thank you guys again for the hard work that you guys do because these are the things that keeps kids out of trouble. These are the skills that they build along the way. Most of these values that I've, I've discovered or have intrinsically adopted are things that I learned from Key Club or the Kiwanis family or working with Model Student Senate, or working with Crosswinds Youth Center. Just little things that I've just adopted that we're all equal. I have an autistic cousin. I've dealt with um, a lot of the um, mental illnesses in school, volunteering. Once you see that, then you see that you're able to cross different social barriers if you just only learn to be patient with whoever you're talking to. I treat everybody as if they have a disorder, something something. It just makes it a lot easier for me to relate. And then I'm honest with myself. I love chicken. You know, that's just part of my nature. So chicken is my weakness. But once you do that, you break those social barriers. And now you get to the real issues. What's bothering you? How do you feel? What are your goals? What, what type of things are troubling in your life? Once they share, I'm listening. Once I respond, they're listening. We have a breakthrough. So tech at home, how much time and technology is appropriate? Tough question. I guess every child has a cell phone now because it's for an emergency. So there's your 24 hour access right there. So how do you take it away now? How do you take it away once you put the invincibility, I call Google like a magic genie bottle. Google, how do I do this? It gives you 78 million results. So let's look at some of the positive things. Google, how do I get to college? Google, how do I get a job? Google, how do I do better in school? Google, how do I develop a better relationship with my mother or father? Instead, Google, how do I build a bomb? It's right there in their hands. It's right there. So how much time is appropriate? Well, it depends on what your child is doing on the computer or on their cell phone. How do you monitor that? That's a relationship question. There's nothing that I can say, there's nothing that anybody else in this room can say that can help you manage your own child. All I can do is give tips and hope, hopefully they get adopted to see positive results. But if your child is literally on the computer all day, and let's add cell phones into that, that's that much time is taken away from the real world. The world that we lived in. I'm old enough, I can say I lived in it too. When you had a friend and you couldn't contact your friend, you just went to go knock on their door. You didn't text. You didn't Facebook. You didn't do all these. It's a lot. I looked up social media. Try it. Google what is social media. That's how I prepare for this presentation. It gives you a great Wikipedia article that has great graphics. I looked at it and I was like, okay, I can't touch on all these topics. It's huge. Your child is surfing the internet. That's scary. 
there's nothing more that you can do just like when you let your child leave home. You, you expect your child not to go rob a store. You expect your child not to go commit murder. You expect your child not to go do something that disgraces your family. Same thing with the cell phone. You just want them to do something responsible with a great tool that's been given to us in society. Technology. How we interact with technology as a family, there's many things that you can do as a family with technology. There's multiple um, role-playing games that families can develop or just even, again, Google. How can I do more activities with my family? Just Google it using technology. There's thousands, if not millions, of apps. There's family focus apps. There's family focused programming. If your child is addicted to a cell phone or to technology in general and you can't seem to take them away from it, get involved with them. It's that simple. Make sure that you're spending that quality time because I'm telling you as a kid who grew up in Bavar County, the biggest issue that I see from all parents that all of my friends talk about, our parents are too busy. Reality check. Our parents are too busy. So if parents take a you know more diverted way into, I'm not interested in how you apply technology, but maybe teach me something on the cell phone, then that's a conversation. Hey, mom, did you know that you can just swipe to the left and then you clear out all this stuff? Wow. Then you have that connection, and maybe those conversations can happen weekly. You're becoming more proficient in technology. They're understanding that you are becoming more proficient in technology, so maybe there's certain things they can't get away with now. Decreasing the digital divide. We're all living with tech-savvy children. But what is it about the digital divide? When I actually started studying technology, it was actually when I was 12. My uncle is a computer scientist from California. He would always come and give me a, a computer and say, go build a new one. So that's what I was doing when I was 12. I was tinkering around with different electronics, destroying every TV, toaster, and RC race car in my house. I drove my mom crazy, completely crazy. But I think they allowed that to happen because they saw that there was no malicious intent with my actions. Same thing now. If you have a kid that's destroying everything in your house, just send them to the garage. Seriously. Because it's that ingenuity, it's that innovation that creates something that's great later on. And they're just trying to build the, the fundamental building blocks. How does the internet work? What is the internet? So just to give you guys kind of a Cliff Notes version of what the internet is, it's a gateway. It's like watching 95 and you're just watching it and you see all the exits. So your child is now driving on 95. How many of you guys are scared of your child driving on 95? All right, so imagine this. When they're at home on their cell phones, they're driving 145 miles per hour down 95, and there's exits. Anytime they see like a flashing light, they just er, get off on the exit. Hopefully they're not getting off in the wrong territory, but that's just basically what the internet is. It's a super highway. So all of these exits that are along the road of 95 are appealing to our kids very directly. There's a new app called Periscope. This is gonna scare you guys a little bit. So when I was studying computers, tinkering around, it is very, very difficult to get broadband bandwidth, basically how much information you can go through a single cable. For whatever reason, the smart people that I'm around, sometimes a little crazy, they've created a way for your cell phone to have live stream capabilities to any other phone in the world. Meaning, I can sit in my room, download Periscope, set it on my desk, and just talk. Thousands of people can sign on and these little hearts pop up. You just tap the screen and hearts pop up. If you're doing something, the hearts keep going and literally you can have thousands of people just sitting here watching you in your home, in your room in your shower, in your closet. That's it. It's here. So the reality check is that there's nothing that I can do. I'm not Mark Zuckerberg. And there's nothing that you can do because you don't have that type of power to destroy Periscope. There's a lot of laws that protect companies like that. Only thing you can do is just let your kids know what they shouldn't do with Periscope. It's 
the best thing. That's how my parents kept me off a lot of the internet sites that I'm not supposed to be on simply by saying, please don't go on the internet. I pay the cell phone bill, I give you this luxury, the one thing that I expect you to do is do the right thing. Cool. I would rather not lose the internet over something you know inappropriate. So having those type of negotiating conversations with your child helps. Treat them like adults, treat them like people. They're already dealing in an adult world as it is. So with the new equipment and the new apps, they are becoming increasingly scary. And it's not just a parental thing. The FCC is driving itself crazy right now. You have this whole net neutrality thing. So what do we do when every company in the world can have a digital presence? Every company in the world can have a digital presence, no matter what they're selling. And then you have children with cell phones in their hand that have no type of filter in accessing this information. Parents have to step in. You're the only defense for this. Or else Periscope becomes the next thing that you know ruins and rots the minds of our children. So this is kind of the wake up call that I hope that we can all have this continued conversation throughout the rest of the day. What's happening with our kids? Well, you don't know. It's that simple. A child could probably go through app-wise, 10, 20 apps a day on their daily functions. That's your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram, your Vines, wherever they're getting their news from, whatever little chat rooms they're involved in, the games they participate in, whatever. It's 20 different things. While you're at work, struggling to pay the bills, seriously, a child's at home just surfing the internet, looking for something to do. So that's more or less the reality of what's going on with your child. The cell phone has unlimited capabilities of what the imagination holds. So this is where the parenting aspect of it is make sure that they're imagining something that's positive. Make sure that they're focusing on something that's productive. Give them a, make, give them a challenge. I watched a movie um, with Tom Hanks um, where there was the kid who lost his father in 9-11. And his father sent him on this wild goose chase. And the reason that he did it is just to keep his child busy. So he gave them an impossible task and told him to find the sixth borough of New York City. So the kid actually went and spent a lot of time, even after his father's death, staying committed to that one thing, that impossible task that the father gave this, the child to do. As I watched that, I understood what the father was doing, and I told myself I would do the same. Tell them to go look for something that can't be found. Tell them to discover something that hasn't been discovered. Tell them to invent something that hasn't been invented. You'd be surprised what they come back with. And that's a different way of utilizing technology as a way to keep your child engaged. If you say nothing, there's going to be an, a different alternative for what they could do. And a lot of those alternatives are things that make me even feel uncomfortable. So for you guys, make sure that you keep engagement with your child. There's apps out there that do amazing things. Challenge them. If you're having remodeling done to your house, challenge your child to get on the computer, find the app to help you redesign your house. Are you gardening? Find the app that can help um, grow different fruits and vegetables in your garden. If you're working on your car, hey, can you find the actual car manual for my car? Give them things that actually show them like, wow, my parent actually needs me for something. And use them for what they're good at. Google it. Google, Facebook, Twitter, I think that's one more. Google, Facebook, and Twitter life secrets. This is the one that I was kind of scared about because I had to figure out how much was I going to tell you guys in comparison to how much the kids actually know. Because now I'm going to be hated by them. They're going to say, Robbie, you're telling all our secrets. So as long as you guys keep this between you and I, then I can give you some of the strategies. Um, and also throughout our workshop, we'll dive deeper into it about what's really going on on social media. Facebook, Twitter, um, and Google being the top three. So let's take Facebook. Facebook was started in 2004. I graduated in 2005. So Facebook to me is a old concept. All it is, I get online. It actually says, what's on your mind? You type what's on your mind depending on how many people you're connected to and how many people they're connected to and how many 
advertisements have been bought or what your zip code is, everything that you say or think is now public access. Anybody in the world. You can just Google anybody's name in here and if you have a Facebook page, that's the first thing that pops up. So Facebook to a child is like a platform to share my thoughts. Nobody around me listens, so my Facebook friends listen. Get it? Nobody at home cares about what I'm doing. Nobody at home is giving me the thumbs up. Nobody at home is liking what I'm doing. So I'll go to Facebook and I'll connect with my social circles and they'll make me feel better. That's why I joined Facebook. It was a way for me to talk. It was a way for me to experience. It was a way for me to share and also connect with different people from around the world. So right now, that's what your child uses Facebook for. I don't get enough of something in the real life, so therefore I have to post it and have all of my digital friends support me. So if you ever want to gain control of your child, like them just as much as their friends on Facebook like them. Just show them, don't just tell them. Facebook is definitely a, it's a tool for depression. It's a tool for uh, self, self-loathing. It's a tool for somebody who doesn't have enough confidence. Because you can throw something up online and just because of the, the numbers, somebody's gonna like it. Hopefully it's the right person. Hopefully it's not somebody who created a fake Facebook account. Hopefully it's not your child that's creating a fake Facebook account. That's Facebook. So when our parents got on Facebook, I wanna say about three, four, five years later, all of us kind of got scared. Uh-oh. We're sharing our deep, intimate thoughts with the world. We didn't know our parents were going to read this. My mom already, she unfriended me a long time ago. She, <laughs> she doesn't like what I put on Facebook. But Facebook, it's exactly what it is. It's a social media peer-to-peer -peer networking site that allows a person like me to connect with a person anywhere in the world and have a dialogue. So in terms, what I use Facebook for was exactly what I intended to start, I talked to strangers for. I connected with people. So Facebook was my number one tool. So here's one of the secrets. If you want to know how to use Facebook productively. It was my number one tool for connecting with people around the world and starting a dialogue that created relationships like Natalia. That's it. I mean, how much easier is it to say, I want to talk to somebody from Spain Hello, hola, it's that easy. So if you're looking at what can Facebook use today, think of it as a student exchange program. This is another activity you can give your child. Hey, you're on Facebook, yes. Here's a list of people from 30 different countries. Connect with them, find out these questions about them, where they're from, what they do in their day, and I want you to tell me about them. That's weird. Well, you're talking to complete strangers anyway, you might as well get something out of it. Fair enough. Twitter, my least favorite. 140 characters of nothingness. Yet, it can bring down a multi-billion dollar corporation. Seriously. I was on flight 17 30 days before it was shot down over Ukraine. I took it from the Netherlands to um, Kuala Lumpur the nicest staff in the entire world. So 30 days later, when you hear a flight on Malaysia Airlines has shot down, and I'm like, that's kind of weird. Oh my gosh, I was on that flight. How interesting. You immediately start seeing the social media response to something like that. The company quickly went into strategic crisis mode. Some of our friends were working on the team. And it's going through Twitter and Facebook and monitoring what people are saying because if a rumor gets out of control too much, it destroys everything. The company was actually on the verge of bankruptcy simply because of a tweet. That's how powerful Twitter is, 140 characters. It's nothingness, but it's everything. Also, fun fact about Twitter, every tweet is stored in the Library of Congress forever. Most kids don't know that. So all those little funny things that they say when they're 10, Hopefully there's not an audit of the National Archives 20 years from now to remind them of everything they said, because it's there. 
That was one of the things they taught us in school. Everything that you put on Twitter is recorded forever. I wish kids understood that. They could stop putting the dumb stuff on Twitter. It's cool to tweet, but it's detrimental to companies, so it's also detrimental to your life. So that's another way to explain Twitter to a lot of teens that don't get it. A tweet can change your life. You decide which way it goes based off of what you tweet. Google. Google is the next one that's it's actually more scary than Facebook. But thinking about Google in terms of technology, it's a tracking mechanism. It allows everybody to know where you are at all points in time. It's really weird. So when you download one of these apps that we talked about, it says accept. What's the first thing everybody does? Accept. Does anybody ever read that stuff? You should. It gives you, it gives the third party company. So let's say right now I build an app and I say, okay, download it and accept. Most people are going to accept it. Let's say 95%. Nobody knows what they accepted. You just gave me access to all your emails. You just gave me access to your email contact list. You gave me access to your location. You gave me access to all your preferences. You gave me access to everything that you do on your cell phone. And you're cool with it. All right, I'm cool with it. That's Google. Give us all the information. We'll exchange a great service, a great product, and we're just going to be cool with it. That's what kids are doing. So just like Google can track where your kid is, here's a positive. You can track where your kid is. I would figure that the power should actually be in the parent's hand than the third party. Fair enough? Right now, per cell phone, you can actually turn on devices per app to track, listen, record, anything. That's Google. It's a huge company, international. Other thing, just some technical stuff, just so you guys, you know, I can use my degree a little bit. Google has data warehouses, I believe seven around the world. So per Google user, all of their information is stored in a data warehouse. I think the closest one here is in Georgia. That's the money. Information. We are currently in the information age. The true money in everything that these companies are making in is in information. How much are we sharing? How much do we release? How much do we give? And they keep them in this multi-billion dollar, super cooled data center. And if you go in, you can probably type your name, and it will pull up everything about you. What you search, where you've been, what you've bought, what your favorite color is. Why? Don't be surprised. We gave it to them. We voluntarily gave it to them. So now, put that into a 12-year-old's hand. What is a 12-year-old giving Google? Everything, if not more. So that's the reality of what the social media gap is really doing to parents and what it's doing to kids. You guys are afraid. I'm afraid. But it's not to be afraid. It's what are you going to do about it? Now that you know, what are you going to do about it? You can't stop it. So go home, have this conversation with your child. Just get them to understand this is not a toy. It's a tool. This is something that can change your life or destroy it. The programs on here are things that you need to know, but use it appropriately. And that's what these digital revolutions really all about. A two-year-old can work an iPad better than I can. That scares me. So as you grow up in age, that's basically where you can get the digital divide. You start off with two. They're technology proficient by the age of five. But they don't know how to type. When was the last time you seen a keyboard? It's happening quickly, guys. I tried to avoid the touch screen altogether. As soon as the touch screen came out, it's like, I can't. I'm a computer guy. I need to now try to find a phone without a touch screen. Seriously, I'm being pushed out. <laughs> and I studied the topic. So I want to make sure that you guys have a lot of the information and just a lot of the confidence of knowing it's not, a, it's not a beast that we can't tackle together. It's just something that we have to talk about one conversation at a time. 
So transforming social media into career training. Facebook, I gave a few ideas. Google, I gave a few ideas. Twitter, I gave you the warning. But there's thousands, if not millions, of other social programs that aren't as big as Twitter, Facebook, and Google. There's a lot of programs. I download different apps. Um, I study my physics. I study uh, my chemistry, my math. I read world events. It's all easy now. That's how I keep up. That's how I learn. That's how I grow. So I look at a device as something that can actually teach me something towards my goals. So the way that you can help your child towards whatever their goals are in life, let's say college, how easy it is right now to fill out a FAFSA, apply for a scholarship, get into a college, it's all online. It's all online. I was still part of a generation who had to mail my applications in. Nobody knows what mail is anymore. It's email? No, actual mail. You mean snail mail? No, a PDF. So now that time that your child is spending on the computer, spending on their phone, hey, did you fill out your application for college yet? You can do it from your iPhone. No more excuses. So the career training aspects and also um, a lot of the things that Natalia and I work on is how do we actually attract students through technology? Technology being just a tool in the beginning anyway. I actually want to demonstrate this. I need two volunteers. I want to demonstrate what technology actually is. Let's give our volunteers a round of applause. Okay, so this is my quick demonstration on what technology is. So we'll have one person stand over here. We'll have one person stand over here. And we'll give you this pen. So let's say that we're back in the Stone Age. So what are your options for getting that pen to her right now in the Stone Age? Okay, so let's take a tour. All right, so that's how things used to be transferred physically. Okay, so now let's take in the telephone. So how do you let her know that you have that pin? Do you actually see, so what do you tell her you have a pin? Say you want to sell that pin. Now we have salesmen. So do you actually see the pin? but she's bought into it. So there is one form of what's happening. There's no physicality in this anymore. So let's say radio. How would you? <laughs> Broadcast. Let's say newspaper. <laughs> they're, not commun they're not touching. Um, internet. So what technology has really done in the grand scheme of things is that we can still move objects, but are we truly moving the physical object? Or are we just talking about it? Technology actually, in its grand scheme, it brings people together, but does it really bring people together? I.e., stand a little closer. So let's say that you're sitting in class as students. Now text. That's what's happening today. Just like if I wanted a friend, nice to meet you, nice to meet you, I actually have to go and shake their hand to meet them, say hello, let them know that I'm a young black guy. <laughs> it's easier when people can see it, when I'm on the phone, when I'm on the radio, when I'm in text message, when I'm on the internet. What really do you understand about the product the service, or the person? What do you really know? Until just what they told you. Well, we've seen how far that gets us. So thank you guys again. So just to wrap up, new future in technology, helping people and organizations meet their goals with the help of modern technology. So let's take this. Let's come up with a few solutions in our last few minutes. So let's say you have two individuals 
somebody trying to communicate a message to the next. What are some new ideas of how technology, using technology, can help? Let me see what you guys have learned today. So how do you communicate to another person effectively using technology? What are some ideas? What are some things that have worked for you guys? How do you guys use emails effectively? What are some things that work? How do you guys use Facebook effectively? I like that. Positive affirmations. Why not? If it's instant messages, send instant love. If it's instant messages, send instant appreciation. In this day and age, nobody should ever go without appreciation if they're doing good work because it's instantaneously can be delivered. If somebody can text me, hey, where are you? I hope they can text me a good morning before they say, where are you? It's just a few more sentences. All right, what other ways are we using technology currently? Yes, ma'am? Can you explain what that is for those who don't know? Oh, wow. I like that. So it's an accountability tool. Um, it's a transparency tool. I, I don't think that I would want my mom to have that when I was at Atlantis, but <laughs> you know, I'm pretty sure there's good purposes for it. Um, but definitely, I think parents and teachers um, definitely need to have that good relationship to start. Um, a lot of my friends became teachers, and they always talked about how the parents never come to things like this. So again, thank you guys, because these are apparently the parents and the people of the community that care. Let's just make next time standing room only. Did you have something? OK, fair enough. I got the perfect rebuttal for you. The business that you paid for, the business that the taxes paid for, the business of what you're supposed to be doing, and when you're 18, I'm out of your business. That's pretty. That's what my dad told me. The comment was for the child responding to the parent that they don't like Adline. That's what it's called, because the parent is too much in their business. Get over it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I get it. I was a child. I was under 18. If the most important thing I can tell everybody who's under 18 is stop complaining. Seriously. Stop complaining. All you have to do is not send naked pictures out to people, not disrespect your family, not do the things that make everybody question your intelligence, and you're fine. It's not, it's not difficult. Yes, ma'am? Of course. And I can also see how the intrusion of parents in schools is, I can see why that's difficult for the child. We just want to grow up. We want to feel like we're making our own decisions. So if I can just give you the little secret, be there, just don't be seen. That's basically the rule of thumb. Be there, just don't be seen. And then we'll talk more in the workshop about different things that, um, how you can accomplish that. When, when I hear comments like, you know, mom, dad, why are you checking an headline? I feel like it's an intrusion. It, it, I feel that it's connected to this powerful adult tool that we've given them, which is a computer. Comes with it. And so w we're telling them you're not an adult yet, but we kind of are. That's the tough part. Um, once you have access, it's like before you get a driver's license. Maybe that's a good idea. Maybe you should have a license to get on the internet. It's pretty, you know. It's just as responsible, it's just as detrimental, and it's just as dangerous. 
So that is kind of where we're at, is the beginning stages of this. We just hit the digital revolution. We just hit people like Mark Zuckerberg ending up as one of the top 10 most powerful people in the world next to the Pope. That's real. Sometimes I feel like I should have went and did something different. But at the same time, is that's the reality. The kids, we're all powerful. As long as everybody has a cell phone connected to the internet, what could you really tell them? So again, building this stronger relationship and rapport with your child is really where it breaks down to is if your child thinks that they're an adult, let's hope they understand the rules of being an adult. It's not limitless. There are rules to this. I break them every day and I learn my lessons the hard way. So that is a really good point. Um, kids need to understand that even though they're kids, the internet makes you an adult because of the things that you can do on the internet. So really good point. Thank you. I'll right, take a few more. Um, well, I have a question and then a, a response. My daughter, when she was seven, I gave her her first cell phone. Wow. I got a lot of criticism, but I did it for a reason. Okay. Um, this day and age, you never know what's going to happen in a school. You always think it's never going to happen in your school. The school shootings, the school bullying, and you're going to be that school. I want to be the one that can have contact with her. The last one, whether it's through a text or a phone call, God forbid it ever happens in her school. Mm -hmm. um, like when the Newtown, the Newtown shootings happened, her school went on lockdown two days later for a threat to her school. So granted, she was probably young, but I didn't care. I want to make sure I have constant contact with her. If somebody tries anything with her, I tell her, snap a picture, scream and run. Haul, but scream, Understood. run, but take a picture first so we can go to the police. <laughs> That's the first thing I do. I, don't I know can actually see that in my head. I yeah. See that. <laughs> Wait a minute, pose, and then yeah. run. <laughs> that makes sense. But I do have a question. Okay. Um, how dangerous is Instagram for children? I tried it for business. I can't figure it out. It took me forever to figure Twitter out because I run my business on Facebook. Mm -hmm. But I've allowed her to have Instagram. And I happened to look through one day. She didn't know that. She does now. <laughs> um, and I was appalled. I didn't know you could text on there. <sighs> and I'm like, oh, hell no. <laughs> what, what is going on? How dangerous is it? And this will be the last question, then we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, Great questions. First one, yes. There is, and I think this is every parent's kind of priority with their child. I don't care what goes on in school, that's my child. Now I went to school with about 2,000 students. That means that there's 2,000 parents to 2,000 students that all feel like they control the situation. That's where the breakdown in safety in school comes because where's the divide? Do you give the responsibility to the school board or to the principal or the administration to deal with emergencies? A lot of parents say, I'm not comfortable with that, so therefore that's what the cell phone is there for. That seems like there needs to be a conversation at that level. How does the school build better rapport so if something like that happens? Because what happens with cell phones, and this is something else, um, and I hope that we never experience this, is called like gridlock. When I was in D.C., I was in the earthquake um, that shook D.C. that um, shifted the Washington Monument off its base. Once we evacuated down to the streets and everybody is on the street, nobody can use their cell phone. That's part of the technology. It only works when a certain amount of people use the tower, not everybody. So during emergencies, let's say that there is a shooting, God forbid, at one of the schools here in Brevard County, nine times out of ten, you won't be able to reach your student anyway. So that's kind of the, again, mom, it's for an emergency. OK, let me talk to the school and figure out what the emergency plan is. I think that's a better connection, because even with trying to find your son or daughter in a chaotic situation through text messages, they're in a chaotic situation. They really don't understand what's going on much more than the police, the media, or anybody else. So sometimes you could be giving your, your child bad advice with that situation because you're not there. But sometimes the school can fail to do something that alerts all the parents immediately, which I know that a lot of schools around the nation, because of this system, is improving. We're just at the beginning of it, so I don't want parents to hold the school board too harshly. Just know that these are new challenges. When I was in school, we weren't allowed to bring cell phones. So I'm dealing with something that I've never experienced before. Wow, you guys actually cheat using cell phones? I mean, how convenient is that? Like you just Google all your answers. 
Seriously. So that's kind of where having the school, having the cell phone with the student, with parent connection, there is no right or wrong answer. It's a conversation at the community level. Instagram, just like any social media platform, texting is part of the features. So any social media program, you can text. It's called the instant messaging approach so that you can actually type if something goes wrong with the video, the pictures, or things like that. Instagram, Facebook, and Google actually have great community standards. So a lot of times, and this is the other aha moment, everything on Facebook gets screened. Everything on Google gets screened. That means that somebody's watching everything that happens. So Instagram is one of those that when there's inappropriate, um, they either take it down themselves or other people can flag it and take it down. So it's not as much as you go to Instagram and find things that you're not supposed to find. It, that's not what Instagram is. There's 5,000 other types of Instagrams built that could be used for that, but Instagram itself's main brands, they have a liability to their consumer base. So a lot of times you're not gonna see the inappropriate things on Facebook, Google, or Twitter, Instagram. You might, but that's just as easy as Sony get it, its emails stolen, Target getting its credit card information stolen, or any other security breach. It's just another company, it's just more information out there to be stolen. So going back to the original point, protect what you put online. That's just, the, that's the rule of thumb. If you don't want these type of issues, if you don't want these type of, just don't put it online, period. So again, um, we'll be talking more and going in depth um, during the workshop, covering topics of how to actually connect with your child. Um, Natalia and I will be doing a great presentation. But I wanna thank you guys again for your time and thank you to Janine and thank you to Guinea and everybody else for helping make this event possible. Thank you.